Grab your hand sanitizer and biohazard suits because you're going to become a germaphobe after this week's video. Happy Halloween everybody and welcome to Sick Flicks, where we take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek by exploring some of the goriest and most disturbing movies ever made. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're covering Eli Roth's debut feature, Cabin Fever. Released in 2002, Cabin Fever isn't quite as infamous as Roth's hostile films or as cannibal opus The Green Inferno. But for fans of Cronenbergian body horror or movies about deadly plagues, this one should still hit the spot. Like all first features, Cabin Fever is a little rough around the edges, and the mix of comedy and gore isn't always as balanced as it should be, but it's still entertaining and gooey. How gooey is it? We'll find out later when we score it on the gore card. But for now, let's break down the plot. The film opens with this random dude carrying a dead something back to his shanty camp. Turns out that thing he's carrying isn't the only thing dead here. His dog is dead too. Ah, oh, poor puppy. Cross the rainbow bridge. The dog's gone gooey, which provides the perfect opportunity for a match cut to these dorks. Serena Vincent is doling out some great life advice. Hey, don't do it! Don't go to college! It's fucking scam! It fucking sucks! Yeah, kid, just work at Walmart. Your life will be fantastic. Ryder Strong's all like, man, I should have gone to college with Corey and Topanga. So, we're like three minutes into this movie, and I'm ready for pretty much everyone on this road trip to die. That's a good sign, right? Eventually, they wind up at this random roadside general store. What's up with that kid's hair? Dude went to the barber and said, hey, I want to look like He-Man. Ryder Strong here tries to say hello, but this kid's gone feral. Hope you got your rabies shot. I mean, this kid was doing a bit. Literally. Everybody knows not to sit next to Dennis. Yeah, maybe you should put that kid in a cage or something. There's a stream around back you want to wash your hands. I'll get you a towel. Um, you guys don't have running water? Indoor plumbing? What kind of shithole store is this? And over there, I used to have in that empty space, I used to have some of the prettiest Shirley Temple bottles I've ever seen. So this is what Redneck Santa Claus does from January through November. Just hangs out working a register at some convenience store in the sticks. How about some fox piss? Yeah, my mom would love fox piss. Oh. Um, I believe that's reindeer piss, sir. And if you spill it, Redneck Santa is going to put you on the naughty list. We learn these guys are going to stay at a cabin in the woods. And if horror movies have taught me anything, it's that staying at a cabin in the woods is a great way to rest and recharge after a long semester at college. Nothing ever goes wrong there. Santa here does offer some advice. If you go in the woods, be very careful. Why? What's in the woods? Trees, mostly, but you young ladies sure are pretty, and you all saw Evil Dead, right? What's the rifle for? Oh, <laughs> that's f Oh, casual racism. Hilarious. After arriving at the cabin, everyone splits up, and Paul and Karen here go for a walk in the woods. How long have we known each other? Seventh grade, right? Yeah, you sat in front of me in Mr. Feeney's class. Thank God you let me copy your tests, or I'd still be in junior high. Paul here is making his move for her, and she's like, hold on man, I want to take a picture of you right now so I can perfectly capture the look on your face when I relegate you to the friend zone. Look, I've always thought that you were really cool, and... Hey, race to the raft. Shut down. Out on the raft, Paul does the impossible and actually escapes the friend zone. Way to go, Paul. Or does he? Is this like a date? Don't be gay. Meanwhile, Abraham Drinken is over here trying to burn down the forest. Maybe he's trying to summon Johnny Cash with that ring of fire. He's out here hunting nature's most dangerous game, Smokey the Bear, when he instead accidentally shoots the weird homeless guy from the start of the movie. Yeah, remember him? He's still in this movie. The gunshot is the least of this dude's worries. He needs help, but Bert's like, Don't make me fucking shoot you, man! Just stay the fuck back, please! Well, that escalated quickly. Bert clearly doesn't bother getting the sick guy any help, because that night everyone's just chilling around the campfire, roasting marshmallows, and telling scary stories. The cops found six bloody torsos tied to the bowling seats. Um, I thought you were supposed to tell scary ghost stories, not true crime stories. This isn't forensic files. Paul finishes his tale and walks right into a jump scare. If you were expecting the bowling alley killer here, sorry. We'll get to him when we cover Ryan Nicholson's gutter balls. Instead, it's director Eli Roth. Yeah, he's a professor. Of being a dog? Oof, faced! 
So yeah, maybe this is why Roth's a director and not really an actor. He tries to crash the party, but they're like, hey, this is a private gathering, man. But then he finds his official invite, weed, making crashing parties easier since forever. This is Justin. But you can call me Grim. Grim? Like Grimace? No, like Grim Reefer, because I got that killer kush. Ooh, faced! Scratch mode in. Thunder breaks up the party and everyone heads back inside. After sharing some wildly inappropriate masturbation stories, there's a knock at the door. Damn, you can't even escape the Jehovah's Witnesses out here in the middle of nowhere. Jeff's like, I'll just take their copy of Watchtower and send them on their way. But he opens the door and finds a jump scare instead. Look, it's the disease dude from earlier, only now with a face that looks like it's rotting off his skull. Bert here is the only sensible guy in the bunch and insists they keep the sick dude outside. Bert hardly looks like a paragon of cleanliness, but he's clearly a germaphobe. While they're debating how to handle this situation, the dude tries to steal their car. He can't seem to get it in drive, so instead he coughs blood cooties all over the interior. Eventually he gives up on the car and starts approaching the girls, who spray him in the face with some bug spray like he's a roach. Paul then tries to be the white knight, but inadvertently sets the dude on fire. Nice work, Paul. Back inside, everyone's trying to figure out what to do like it's I know what you did last summer only with more flesh-eating bacteria. We have to tell the police it wasn't our fault. The next morning, we find the sick guy. The good news is, he's no longer on fire. The bad news is, it's because he's floating face down in a stream. The worst news is, is whatever made him sick is now in the water, which runs through a pipe right back to the cabin. Hope you're not thirsty. Inside, Paul talks to Karen, and it looks like he's firmly back in the friend zone. Or not. Man, this relationship is like a friggin' yo-yo. Then he gives her some of his cootie water. What a gentleman. Bert and Jeff, meanwhile, stumble across this lady, who's making this pig squeal like a pig. Literally. Guess they can't afford heavy punching bags out here in the sticks and just have to make do with whatever's hanging around. I mean, that's one way to tenderize, I guess. Mike Tyson here stops beating her meat long enough to deliver some exposition. Now what am I supposed to do with sick hog, huh? Huh? Because I am not about to eat that meat, would you? Once she's done complaining about the pork, she offers to let them come inside while she calls them a tow truck. Don't look now, but that guy in the photo looks an awful lot like the crazy guy they set on fire. Jeff and Bert decide that maybe a walk is just what the doctor ordered and beat feet out of there before she starts tenderizing them. Marcy, meanwhile, is rowing her way back to civilization. She makes landfall but finds the nearby shore deserted. I claim this land for college dropouts everywhere. After some gratuitous Texas Chainsaw Massacre style butt cam shots, she finds a house. Man, you can tell these city kids know nothing about rural America. Walking into some random country dude's shack is a good way to get shot in the face, at best, or tortured and locked in a basement as a breeding machine, at worst. She creeps around inside and wanders right into another jump scare. It's not the kid from Deliverance, it's just Bert. Although, to be fair, he might be the kid from Deliverance all grown up. Back at the cabin, there's a knock at the door. It's probably Avon. Turns out it's actually Deputy Winston. He's checking up on a disturbance report from the night before. He lets them off with a warning, but promises he's gonna write them a citation if they don't start partying harder. Hey, <laughs> looks like you guys were doing some pretty good partying, huh, man? Paul and Bert decide to clean the truck, but they're accosted by Eli Roth's crazy dog. Luckily for them, Marcy's around to scare it off with the gun. Back inside, it's time for another meeting, and everyone's ready to leave, but Karen here feels sick. Probably just something she ate in her drink. Friendzone, I, I mean Paul, takes Karen some more water. Jesus, man, why not just shoot her with that rifle? At least he'd kill her faster that way. After a snuggle session, Paul makes one more attempt to get out of the friend zone. Dude's really desperate. I mean, best case scenario, she has the flu. Also, you know these squishy sounds can't be good, right? Look, just insert your own period joke here. Bird imposes quarantine rules, which is probably a good move. Karen looks like she ran into Anthony Wong in the Ebola syndrome at this point. Then we have a Thing-esque scene where everyone has to prove they're not infected too. With everyone else okay, these compassionate souls then force Karen out of the house and lock her up in the shed. Hey, try not to barf all over the walls. Inside, Marcy made chili, but no one's eaten. Tensions are rising as Bert and Jeff square off for a two out of three falls match for the title of biggest asshole in this movie. The next morning, the truck starts and everyone's ready to leave. Everyone except Karen, who's still alive but drawing flies. 
Lift her easy. Pieces are gonna start falling off. Outside, Bert's coughing up blood and starting to get the rash too. But you know he's not gonna tell anyone. After an argument about who gets to ride shotgun, Karen decides to spruce the place up with some more projectile blood vomiting. Man, we just had this thing detailed. Bert gets pissed and hightails it out of there, leaving everyone else stuck at the cabin with Karen. Then Jeff grabs the beer and gives a touching speech about helping those in need. Now she's bleeding all over both you guys, so you two can fucking rot! What a humanitarian. With Jeff gone and Karen looking like she's pretty much off the market, Paul figures maybe this is a good time to make his move for Marcy. Or maybe she's gonna make her move for him. Everyone around you screaming and yelling, we're going down, we're going down. All you really want to do is grab the person next to you and fuck the shit out of them. Are you giving me a sign here? I mean, first you're talking about people dying horribly, then in the next sentence you're talking about sex. Women are so confusing. They do the deed and uh oh, those handprints on Marcy's back don't look healthy at all. Since he went in bareback, Paul here decides he better disinfect his little pal with some Listerine. I don't think that's really gonna help anything, but your pee will be minty, I guess. Over in the other bathroom, yeah, Marcy's screwed. I mean, beyond what just happened in the bedroom. Bert makes it back to the general store. Dude goes to call the cops while Dennis here screams pancakes and does some kung fu routine. This reminds me of that scene in Pieces where the random kung fu professor shows up to attack Linda Day George. He takes a bite out of Bert, but clearly didn't realize Bert tastes like booze and sweaty jock straps. Dad here is not real big on hospitality. He chases Bert off, then tells this giant that the rest of the crew is out at that cabin in the woods. Looks like they're gonna go do some quarantining of their own. Back at the cabin, Marcy's decided a nice hot bath will make her. Jesus, look at her back. I don't know if proactive is gonna help with that back knee. The truck breaks down and the rednecks decide to reenact the most dangerous game by hunting down Bert. Although really, maybe we should retitle it the most stupid game, because Bert isn't really all that dangerous, but he's definitely dumb. Paul then makes a disturbing discovery when he finds the burned dead guy floating in the reservoir where all the drinking water comes from. Fresh mountain spring water, now flavored with dead hobo. Well, we're pretty much screwed, and I always wanted to poke a dead guy with a stick. Might as well just scratch this one off the bucket list. Of course he falls right into the water, right on top of that corpse. Nice work, Paul. I'm sure you'll be fine. Marcy's still taking her bath in that infected water and has decided this seems like a good time to shave her legs. Don't want to have hairy legs for your date with the coroner after all, right? Too bad for her she's not just shaving off hair, she's taking off some skin too. If that weren't bad enough, she heads outside, and if you guess that crazy dog was waiting on her, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. The dog treats her like a chew toy, and surprisingly, Roth keeps it all off screen. We are treated to this severed foot at least, so that's something, I guess. Inside the barn, the dog's eating Karen too, but then decides he'd like something a little fresher, so he starts chasing Paul. Paul makes it to the gun though, and it's goodbye old yeller time. Back in the barn, Karen's modeling her eyes without a face costume. Looking good. Paul apparently really digs her because he beats her in the face repeatedly with a shovel. After that, he packs his stuff and is ready to leave, but someone left a bird on the porch. Great, now I gotta clean up this mess. Don't look now, but the rednecks are at the cabin. Why is the big dude carrying around what looks like a box of his dead dog's ashes? They bust in and Bert's waiting for them, but he's a little slow on the draw. Good night, sweet prince. Paul digs deep and nails this dude with the shovel, and in a two for one gets the added bonus of the guy shooting Dennis's redneck dad. There's one dude left, but he's fumbling with his weird box. Paul jams this screwdriver right into his ear. You're screwed, pal. Dad's still alive though and trying to crawl away. Hey, what's your hurry, man? You should stick around for a while. Then he goes all evil dead and locks the last survivor in the basement. Hope there aren't tapes of ancient Kandarian demon resurrection rituals down there. If you're wondering how Bert's doing, don't worry. That shotgun blast to the head really cleared out his sinuses. Better than Claritin. Paul then takes off to find Jeff, but instead finds Eli Roth who gives a gutsy performance even in death. After finding the yokel's truck, Paul drives towards civilization. But bad news, he's got some red marks on his hands. Then, because he's distracted, he runs over one of Redneck Santa's reindeer. No, not Leroy the Redneck Reindeer. Leroy's still alive and stuck in the windshield. He's kicking around like he's auditioning for the Rockettes chorus line, but Paul manages to blast him with the shotgun without taking a hoof to the face. Hey, remember Deputy Winston? He's still in this movie. He's over here partying with the locals. Hope you're not encouraging underage drinking there, officer.
To be honest, this party looks pretty lame, but there's nothing to liven things up quite like a guy covered in blood crashing the thing. Paul's about to make it back to civilization, but you know, Murphy's Law and all that. You never mind them. We got bigger problems. Some kids up in a cabin are on a killing spree. There's two, possibly three casualties already. Winston can't shoot Paul because his gun's in the car, but this lame fish cover band is gonna beat him with their instruments. Too bad they're as wimpy as their music because Paul starts puking blood on all of them. After knocking out Winston, and really, what's an assaulting an officer charge at this point? You've already killed people. Paul makes his way to the road where no one will stop for him. Because yeah, dude's covered in blood. He does finally make it to the hospital thanks to a trucker. Talk about curbside drop off. As they cart him inside, he sees this strange bunny man and then he has a bunch of flashbacks to earlier in the movie. You know, just in case you forgot those scenes happened. When he wakes up, the sores are spreading and the authorities want answers. They can't help him, so Winston gets to drive him to the city. And by city, I mean dump him out in the middle of nowhere to die. We have a long night of party, man, I'm gonna tell you that, a long night. Meanwhile, Jeff's still out here. He shambles back to the cabin to find body parts everywhere. The inside's no better. Hate to break it to you, man, but I don't think you're getting your security deposit back on this rental. Jeff's just thrilled he made it. I knew it! I fucking made it! And you know that means he's about to be dead. He heads out the door and the cops basically give him the full lead treatment. Then, continuing the Night of the Living Dead motif, they light the bodies on fire. Hope someone brought stuff to make some s'mores. But you know that's not the end, right? Winston dumped Paul upstream, and some kids are getting water in their cooler. The cops stop by to talk to Redneck Santa, and surprise, those kids who were getting the water are selling lemonade. Then we get a payoff for the awful N-word joke, and some Hee Haw Reject Band plays us into the credits. But wait, there's a post credit scene. What is this, a Marvel movie? Seems that a lot of people are drinking that lemonade, including this truck driver, delivering some down-home drinking water. We might have a pandemic on our hands. Cabin Fever spawned not only two sequels, but it also got the remake treatment in 2016. Roth didn't direct any of the subsequent films, and it shows. As I mentioned earlier, this film is a little rough around the edges. Not all of the comedy works, the characters are all pretty unlikable, and for a film hailed for its gore, a lot of it is kept off screen. Problems aside, it's still an entertaining enough way to kill 95 minutes. This is not Roth's finest work, but the unrated cut of the film is fairly gory, and you can certainly see Roth's potential as a filmmaker. But just how many barf bags will Cabin Fever earn? Let's score it on the gore card and find out. In terms of gross anatomy, Cabin Fever mostly delivers. FX Legends KNB provided the splatter for this feature, and it's pretty gruesome by mainstream standards, but unlikely to make any serious gore geek flinch. Roth's debut feature offers up lots of projectile blood vomiting, numerous scenes of rotting flesh, a shotgun to the head gag, and a lot of strewn about body parts after that dog attack. Again, this is pretty gory for a mainstream film, but for a sick flick, too much of the carnage happens off screen for my liking. And because of that, Cabin Fever earns three barf bags out of five. It's not super splattery, but it's still pretty good. Have you seen Cabin Fever? Let me know what you thought of it in the comment section below. And while you're down there, why not like this video and subscribe to the channel? I've booked a cabin in the woods for a little getaway and I want to bring some of you guys along with me. I hear it's on a really great lake. You wouldn't want to miss out on that, would you? Of course you wouldn't. Oh, and be sure to check out some of my other videos. You'll find links to more sick flicks here on the screen. Grab your Halloween haul and binge some of this content. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.